slightly different. I'm Petu Washde. My name is Tawa Dushno. Come to you from Kyle Pine Ridge, South Dakota, and I'm honored to be here today to welcome you all on behalf of the South Dakota Humanities Council, which produces the annual Festival of Books. We hope that you enjoy the festival and that you'll provide feedback about this year's event. The link to our online survey is available at, so at sdbookfestival.com, and QR codes can be found at our information tables. You can help keep the festival free by making a tax-deductible donation to the South Dakota Humanities Council. To donate, visit sdhumanities.org or stop at the information booth over at the lodge at Deadwood. With your gift, you can enter our drawing for the original Festival Guide cover painting by local artist Gary Steinley. Donate $50 for your first raffle entry and $10 for each entry after that. This festival would not be possible without the generous support of the many, many organizations and individuals who have already donated and sponsored and support this event. Today's program, We Are the Stars, Colonizing and Decolonizing the Ocheti Shakolin Literary Tradition with Sarah Hernandez. Sarah, is she, is she si Chongu? Sorry about that. She's a professor of Native American literature and director of the Institute for American Indian Research at the University of New Mexico. Her research focuses on early and contemporary Native American literature. Hernandez is a member of the Ocheti Shakoni Writers Society, a nonprofit for Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota writers. Together, they launched Hashtag Native Reads, a community-based reading campaign and podcast series to increase knowledge and appreciation of the Ocheti Shakoni literary tradition. Tayayahi, Sarah, thank you for being here. All right, good afternoon. Um, um, Happy to be here this afternoon. I've attended the South Dakota Book Festival quite a few times as a participant, and so this is one of my first times um, being able to share my work with you. Um, so today I'd like to talk about my new book, We Are the Stars, Colonizing and Decolonizing the Ocheti Shakoin Literary Tradition. And this book began as my dissertation project. Just as I began my dissertation, I met Dakota scholar Elizabeth Cooklin and she invited me to the Oak Lake Writer Society and their annual summer tribal writing retreats. These retreats have been instrumental in helping me understand and further appreciate our rich and complex literary tradition. I wish every native writer and scholar had access to a supportive, creative, and intellectual space such as this one. Through the society, I gained a wonderful circle of mentors and friends who are committed to perfecting and I'm going to 
land. Over the past four centuries, settler colonizers, including European and American fur traders, explorers, government officials, missionaries, teachers, etc., have reduced the rich and complex Ocheti Shakoin oral tradition to a simpler English translation that primarily exists in print and now in electronic form. Efforts to linguistically colonize the Ocheti Shakoin oral tradition began in earnest in the early 19th century when Congregationalist and Presbyterian missionaries invaded Minnesota Makoche, or the land where the waters are so clear they reflect the clouds. That's Dakota Territory or present-day Minnesota. The Madakwatan Dakota, the Ocheti Shakoin tribe located farthest east, was the first of our seven sister tribes to encounter missionary colonizers moving westward to, quote, put God's thoughts into their speech, end quote. In 1833, Samuel and Gideon Pond, two volunteer missionaries from Connecticut, traveled to Minishota Makoche to tame the, quote, wild, bloodthirsty, and superstitious Dakotas. The two Pond brothers were soon followed by Reverends Thomas Williamson and Stephen Riggs, along with several other missionary families. Over the next four decades, the Pond, Williamson, and Riggs families and their colleagues worked together closely to transform the Dakota literary tradition from an oral to a print form. Based on these early translation efforts, they published and disseminated what some scholars still mis misleadingly refer to as, quote, the first Dakota library, a collection of 50 religious and secular texts, including a Dakota alphabet, dictionary, grammar, gospel, and two bilingual newspapers, and numerous other publications. This library became a colonial blueprint that subsequent missionary translators used as a model to also misinterpret Nakota and Lakota dialects. I argue that missionary translations of the Dakota language set a dangerous precedent, one that denigrated Ocheti Shakoin star knowledge and supplanted our tribal land narratives with new settler colonial land narratives that ensured that many of our people converted to Christianity and assimilated to the American nation. In 1833, Ocheti Shakoin winter counts document a great meteor shower, now known to many indigenous and non-indigenous people as the years the stars fell. Coincidence or not, the years the stars fell also marks the same year missionary colonizers began transcribing the Ocheti Shakoin oral tradition. Not only did this literary transformation impact how Ocheti Shakoin star knowledge was shared with Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota people and communities, it also affected who shared our tribal land narratives, how they shared them, and why they shared them. As discussed in chapter one, missionary colonizers did not simply learn the Dakota language to share the word of God with their potential converts. They also used their recently acquired knowledge of Dakota language and literature to mistranslate the treaties that physically and politically dispossessed the N Dakota and later the Nakota and Lakota people of their ancestral homelands. The American nation's failure to uphold these mistranslated treaties culminated in the U.S.-Dakota War of 1862. After the Six-Week War, Dakota men were sentenced to either execution or imprisonment and Dakota women, children, and elders were exiled from Minishota Makoche and forcibly marched to the Crow Creek Agency, a concentration camp now known as the Crow Creek Sioux Reservation, located in central South Dakota, where 300 Dakota women, children, and elders died of malnutrition, disease, and exposure. 
Those who didn't die were physically separated from their husbands, fathers, brothers, and sons, and thrust into a new, colonized, suppressed cultural environment. At Crow Creek, Dakota women were forced to work for white settlers, chopping wood, drawing water, harvesting and preparing food, and even digging trenches with their bare hands. Often, Dakota women were sexually assaulted in exchange for food and shelter. Despite genocide, forced separation, sexual violence, and numerous other indignities, these women somehow maintained their roles as the keepers of the traditions and continued to preserve and perpetuate the ancestral star knowledge and tribal land narratives that have long sustained the Ocheti Shakoin. As Sichangu Lakota elder Albert Whitehat states, quote, we survived because of our mothers and grandmothers and their stories. We are the stars colonizing and decolonizing the Ocheti Shakoin literary tradition seeks to honor and celebrate Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota women for their unwavering commitment to sustaining our people, communities, and nations, despite significant barriers and challenges imposed by settler society. Dakota scholar Elizabeth Cook Lynn, who dedicated her life to protecting and defending the Ocheti Shakoin literary tradition, suggested the title for this book as a reminder that Dakota people came from the stars to be on earth. As tribal people, our oral traditions and the printed texts that emerge from them have always been a source of strength and inspiration. Over the past 200 years, however, the Ocheti Shakoin oral tradition has been subjected to several dramatic, often traumatic changes. This, this book examines this traumatic literary history and explores how the printed word has been used to delegitimize our tribal land narratives and sever our rightful connection to the land that the American nation currently occupies. We Are the Stars decolonizes the Ocheti Shakoin literary tradition by reclaiming and revitalizing our tribal land narratives to remind contemporary Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota people where we came from, who we are, and what's expected of us. And I'd like to share the cover of my book. Um, on the cover of my book, I attempted to capture the complicated literary history um, of the Ocheti Shakoin. This cover was designed by my brother, Ruben Hernandez. And the cover of this book, um, it's an original piece of ledger art. While imprisoned at concentration camps, such as the ones constructed after the U.S.-Dakota War of 1862, indigenous artists began using ledger art to protest U.S. occupation and the exploitation of indigenous land, people, and resources. Today, indigenous ledger art is viewed as a symbol of indigenous resistance and reclamation. The cover of this book is composed of two separate images, one layered on top of the other. Riggs' flawed translation of the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux is in the foreground as a stark reminder of how the United States, as a settler colonial nation, appropriated the Dakota oral tradition and the traditional role Dakota women played in tribal society to undermine the Dakota nation's intimate connection to their ancestral homelands. Layered atop this mistranslated treaty are three female Ocheti Shakoin storytellers representing the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota nations. Wrapped in shawls, adorned with stars, representing the knowledge and wisdom of our ancestors. These three culture keepers and culture bearers are a reminder of the Ocheti Shakoin oral tradition and of the strength and resilience of the many Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota women who have fiercely protected and defended our intellectual and literary traditions for generations to sustain our tribal nations. The cover of this book is a symbol of decolonization and healing. For nearly 200 years, American Indian, Native American, indigenous literatures have been shaped and defined by individuals from outside our tribal communities. It is time for citizens of sovereign tribal nations to define and articulate our own literary traditions. And so I'm an enrolled citizen of the Sichangu Lakota Oate, my family, are the floods and the colognes from the Rosebud Reservation. I didn't grow up on the reservation. I grew up in Denver, Colorado, and growing up in Denver, I had never read a book by a writer from my own tribal community. In fact, I didn't read a book by a native writer until I was a 19-year-old college freshman, and I didn't read a book by an author from Rosebud until I was 25 years old, 
and that book was actually Joseph Marshall's book, who spoke right before me. Um, it, it was his book, The Dance House. And reading that book by writers from my own tribal community was powerful. Um, you know, it was the first time I had seen my people in my community positively reflected in a book. And I wish I had been encouraged to pick up one of these books earlier, um, but I hadn't. And a big reason why I wasn't encouraged to pick up one of these books earlier is because few people think we actually have our own literary tradition. And so when I began graduate school, I made a conscious decision to seek out books specifically by Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota writers. And I discovered that we had published nearly 200 books over the past 200 years. And so now, as a literary scholar, my goal is to make these books more accessible to Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota youth. Um, like I said, I firmly believe our children deserve to see themselves and their communities positively reflected in their books and in their classrooms. And so We Are the Stars attempts to draw attention to the Ochetti Shakowin's rich and complex literary history. Our literary history, especially our women, overcame a number of obstacles to preserve and perpetuate our oral tradition in written form. So each chapter of my book is dedicated to a different writer and explores the various obstacles they had to overcome to protect and defend our sophisticated intellectual traditions. And so I think for us to fully understand and appreciate Ochetti Shakowin literature, we have to look at um, our literary tradition in its entirety. And we need to consider the collective wisdom of our literary ancestors. So each of the writers um, that I'm going to discuss here in a little bit is building upon the storytellers and the writers who came before them. And I believe that Dakota historian Wazi Yadawin describes the nature and the function of the Ocheti Shakowin literary tradition best. She says, quote, our oral tradition is a kind of web in which each strand is part of a whole. The individual strands, which may be compared to a single story, are most powerful when connected to make an entire web. That is, when as many stories as possible are examined in their entirety. Each of our stories possesses meaning and power, but they are most significant when understood in relation to other stories in the same oral tradition. So like the oral tradition, this literary history, my book, um, is also organized like a web. It's comprised of individual stories that when woven together um, and considered collectively, illuminate the strength and the resilience of our people and our intellectual traditions. Additionally, I think that it's also important to focus on all of the authors in my book rather than just singling out one author. Um, because this book is intended to be a critique of settler colonialism. And settler colonialism isn't a single event, but rather it's a continuous and ongoing problem that still persists today. And so what is settler colonialism? Oops, I'm getting confused here. So what is settler colonialism? As Australian historian Patrick Wolfe points out, settler colonialism or invasion is a structure, not an event. And so what I always tell my students, right, is that settler colonialism didn't just occur in 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. It didn't just occur in 1620 when pilgrims arrived on this continent. Settler colonialism is a continuous and ongoing process of indigenous erasure that seeks to eliminate tribes and tribal nationhood by destroying indigenous lifeways and replacing them with Western beliefs and values. So in my book, I argue that the most obvious example of settler colonialism is the continual silencing and oppression of indigenous women. For example, the Ocheti Shakowin, like many tribal nations, were traditionally matriarchal societies that respected women and the land as the givers of life and nourishment. Their rival of settler colonizers, however, replaced the Ocheti Shakowin's traditionally matriarchal system honoring indigenous women with an oppressive patriarchal regime that demeans and devalues them. And Joseph Marshall was talking about that in his presentation just a little while ago. We Are the Stars critically examines how missionaries and other settler colonizers have superimposed their will on the Ocheti Shakowin, 
by misappropriating our oral traditions, displacing Ocheti Shakoin women as our traditional culture keepers and culture bearers, and severing our connection to our ancestral homelands, both ideologically and territorially. And so I'm gonna go through um, each chapter of my book. My book is organized chronologically, beginning with um, missionaries and the first moment that our oral tradition appeared in print. And so when I first began this project, I knew that I wanted to start by exploring the very first moment that our oral traditions began appearing in print. Excuse me. And this led me directly to three missionary families, the Pond, Williamson, and Riggs families, um, who began invading Dakota Territory in 1833. These three families have long been romanticized in Minnesota history. These three families have been praised for helping, quote, civilize and Christianizing Dakota people and for helping establish Minnesota statehood. In this chapter, I examine how these three missionary families use translation and the printing press to, internal, to internally and externally colonize the Dakota nation. So as demonstrated by this quote here, Reverend Stephen R. Riggs was very clear about his intentions to internally or linguistically colonize the Dakota nation. He explicitly states in his memoir, quote, the labor of writing was undertaken as a means to a greater end, to put God's thoughts into their speech, end quote. So Riggs and his missionary colleagues devoted their entire life to transcribing and translating Dakota language and literature. In this chapter, I show how they deconstructed the Dakota oral tradition, story by story, sentence by sentence, word by word, and letter by letter so that they could reconstruct and revise our tribal land narratives to reflect a new settler colonial land narrative that privileged the American nation at the expense of D the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota nations. So interestingly, even though Riggs and his missionary colleagues were quite clear here about their colonial agenda, few scholars have questioned the authenticity or the accuracy of Riggs's translations. Many contemporary anthropologists and historians even praise these missionary translations as, quote, the earliest and most authentic example of North American oral literature written by native speakers. And so my goal throughout this entire project has been to challenge these dominant views and to show that, um, and to show that each one of the materials in the first Dakota library, first Dakota library is not authentic. Um, and has actually been colonized and filtered through a Western Christian lens. And so for time's sake, I'm not going to examine each one of those texts here, but a recurring theme I noticed among all of these translations is that missionaries often describe Dakota language and literature as an inferior knowledge system that was rapidly nearing extinction. And this is perhaps most evident in the missionaries' translation of the Dakota creation narrative. So according to Dakota oral histories, Dakota people came from the stars and emerged from the waters at a specific site at the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers, known as Badote. In 1851, missionary colonizers retranslated this creation narrative, and they retranslated this narrative in the newspapers they circulated throughout Minnesota. They called this narrative a myth or a legend, and they did so to undermine the Dakota Nation's long-standing connection to a place that missionaries and other colonizers coveted for themselves. I argue that by dismissing this creation narrative and calling its legitimacy into question, missionaries and other settlers were able to undermine any ethical or legal connection that the Dakota Nation had to their ancestral homelands. After mistranslating the Dakota creation narratives, missionary colonizers boldly proclaimed that Badote, the place of Dakota people's first creation, would, quote, one day prove to be the center of the United States of America. And indeed, today it is, right? But it has been renamed Minnesota. So in this chapter, I argue that missionary colonizers not only ex internally colonized Dakota people, by mistranslating their creation narratives, but they also externally colonized the Dakota nation by using their newfound knowledge of Dakota language and literature to mistranslate the treaties that dispossessed Dakota people of their ancestral homelands. And these treaties include treaties like the one on the cover of my book. So according to Dakota scholar Gwen Westerman, Reverend Stephen R. Riggs used his newfound knowledge of the Dakota language 
to mistranslate these treaties. She argues that he consciously and deliberately misrepresented the terms of these treaties by manipulating Dakota kinship terms, misinterpreting the words seed and sell, and adding an addendum that helped redirect treaty annuities to fur traders. By misrepresenting the term of these treaties, Riggs and his missionary colleagues sparked a chain reaction of repercussions, including broken treaties, land dispossession, starvation, war, imprisonment, mass execution, and exile. That disenfranchised the Dakota nation and deeply traumatized generations of Dakota people. As indicated by the Dakota writers and scholars featured in this book, Dakota people are still working diligently to decolonize their language and literature and to heal from this trauma. And so the next author I talk about is Charles Eastman. Um, Charles Eastman, um, in this chapter, which I've titled The Matriarchal Patriarchal Shift, it explores the long-term consequences of these mistranslated treaties. So these mistranslated treaties led to the Dakota War of 1862, which then led to the largest mass execution in US history when 38 Dakota men were hanged the day after Christmas for trying to protect and defend their families and communities. After the war, Dakota people were exiled from their ancestral homelands. Dakota men were imprisoned in Davenport, Iowa for four years. Meanwhile, Dakota women, children, and elders were forced to march more than 300 miles to another concentration camp in central South Dakota. Adding insult to injury, after the 1862 war, missionaries and government officials joined forces to further subdue and oppress Dakota people through a system of boarding schools intended to eradicate Dakota language and culture. So in this book, I argue that these missionary-led, government-funded boarding schools further displaced Dakota women by preventing them from mothering their own children and sharing their cultural and knowledge, cultural knowledge and wisdom embedded in their tribal land narratives. So specifically, this chapter, it examines the life and literature of Ohiesa, or Charles Eastman, often known as the first published Dakota writer. Ohiesa was born in 1858, four years before the U.S.-Dakota War of 1862. After the war, he and his grandmother fled from Minnesota Makoche for freedom in Canada. This decision allowed the four-year-old boy and his grandmother to avoid relocation and the forced march from their ancestral homelands to the Crow Creek Agency, where 13,000 13, of their Dakota relatives died within a year from starvation, exposure, and disease. Eastman lived with his grandmother and his uncle in Canada until he was 15 years old. And then at 15, Eastman's father, who was one of the men imprisoned after the war, returned and he sent his son to Santee Normal Training School. At this boarding school, Eastman learned under Alfred Riggs, who was the son of Stephen Riggs, and John Williamson, who was the son of Thomas Williamson. Um, according to Eastman, this new generation of missionary colonizers became his greatest teachers and mentors, and they supplanted his grandmother and his father as his primary caregivers and educators. So at boarding schools, missionaries used this first Dakota library developed by their fathers as a key linguistic or literary tool to replace the Dakota oral tradition with the American literary canon. As Eastman recalls in this quote here, he says, Dr. Riggs gave me a little English primer to study, also one or two books in the Dakota language, which I had learned to read in day school. There was the translation of the Psalms and of the Pilgrim's Progress. I must confess that at that time, I would have preferred one of my grandmother's evening stories. And so as discussed in my previous chapter, missionaries translated and transcribed more than 50 books into the Dakota language. And according to Eastman, he devoured every single one of these books until, quote, he read all that was published in the Sioux. Often the message that Eastman was receiving when he read these books was that, um, was that he and other Native students, that our people, were morally and intellectually inferior. And so without a doubt, these books negatively shaped and influenced Eastman's perception of himself and his community. And it took him a lifetime to overcome these missionary teachings. So in the second chapter of my book, I explicate Eastman's three autobiographies, Indian Boyhood, From the Deep Woods to Civilization, and The Soul of the Indian, to show how his perception of the missionaries and the church changed throughout his lifetime. When Eastman first began writing and publishing, his critiques of settler society were subtle and indirect. 
However, by the time he penned The Soul of the Indian in his late 40s, he had no trouble explicitly condemning, quote, the fur traders, the black robe priests, the military, and finally the Protestant missionaries for the disintegration of the Indian nations and the overthrow of their religions. During his lifetime, Eastman personally witnessed and experienced disintegration numerous times, from the U.S. Dakota War of 1862 to the 1890 massacre at Wounded Knee, where he was forced to tend to his injured and dying Lakota relatives. Throughout The Soul of the Indian, one of Eastman's last books, he explicitly criticizes missionary colonizers for displacing Ocheti Shakoin women like his grandmother from their traditional role in society as culture keepers and culture bearers. He unequivocally, unequivocally states, Dakota women, quote, ruled undisputed and were a tower of moral and spiritual strength until the coming of the border white man, the soldier, and the traitor. And so Eastman suggests that the only way to reunite the Ocheti Shakoin is to recenter Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota women in tribal society and to empower them to, quote, repeat our time hallowed tales with dignity and authority so as to lead us into our inheritance and the stored up wisdom and experience of our race. During his lifetime, Eastman did his best to reclaim and reimagine his grandmother's tribal land narratives as print literature. He published 11 books that helped lay the groundwork for future literary decolonization efforts. However, given the time period he was born, Eastman faced a number of challenges from settler society that prevented him from fully embracing his grandmother's teachings. In this book, I argue that decolonization is a long-term process that has taken and will take many generations to achieve. So as demonstrated in the next chapter, each one of the authors that I showcase in my book, they try to build upon the efforts of the writer who came before him or her in their attempts to decolonize our language and our literature. And so after Eastman, I focus on Ella Cara Deloria. Um, born in 1889, Ella Deloria is often known as the first Dakota anthropologist and linguist. Um, her personal and professional goal was to reclaim and revitalize uh, the Ocheti Shakoin literary tradition for future generations of Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota youth. According to Dakota historian Philip Deloria, his great aunt was well aware of, quote, the importance Dakota of Dakota culture and the critical role of women as our culture carriers. It is a lesson that Deloria learned from her mother, from her grandmother, and other female writers. Today, many indigenous and non-indigenous scholars theorize that Deloria, Deloria used her anthropological and linguistic training to reimagine this traditional role in a more modern tribal context. Now, for more than a decade, Deloria worked with famed anthropologist Franz Boas and his colleagues to correct and retranslate a thousand handwritten manuscript pages assembled by the Episcopal Church and the Bureau of American Ethnology. So among this 1,000 pages of paper were translations by Stephen Riggs and the two Prawn brothers. And so in addition to translating these manuscripts, Boaz asked Deloria to conduct her own field research and to interview Ocheti Shakoin storytellers to, bury, to verify the content of these early missionary translations. And so from 1927 to 1974, Deloria collected more than 30 file boxes um, of interviews, reports, notes on Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota language and literature. And these are all stored in Chamberlain at the Dakota Indian Foundation. And so while conducting this research, Deloria began to notice a lot of discrepancies between the printed transcripts she read and the oral stories that she heard from her elders. She tried to express these concerns to Boaz, um, and he largely dismissed her concerns as minor and insignificant. However, as indicated by this quote here, these discrepancies frustrated and nagged at Deloria. She says, quote, I can't just consult native informants, translate their contributions and let it go at that. Almost always I know something in addition or some more of the same thing not touched on by other anthropologists, and I must include that too. So in this chapter, I argue that after Boaz died, Deloria developed her own unique literary translation method to decolonize the Ocheti Shakoin literary tradition and to recenter women as our traditional culture keepers and culture bearers. So in chapter three, I outlined Deloria's new innovative translation method um, 
And I compare Deloria's translation of Fallen Star to Riggs's colonized translation of Fallen Star. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through that a little bit here. Um, there's not too much time, but I do want to go through it. Deloria's professional co correspondence with the Boaz indicates that she noticed a number of linguistic and cultural inaccuracy in Riggs's translation. Although Boaz encouraged Deloria to correct Riggs's grammar and syntax, he didn't allow her to address any of the cultural inaccuracies she observed in Riggs's translation. Instead, Boaz republished Riggs's flawed translation in 1941 with little to no changes. While looking at Deloria's um, archive in Chamberlain, I found her personal translation of Fallen Star, and I noticed that she started to correct a number of these cultural inaccuracies herself. And so, like I said, I compared these two translations side by side. And so when you compare them side by side, they seem somewhat similar, right? The plot is similar in both translation. Um, the story of Fallen Star is about a young woman who marries a star, becomes pregnant, falls through a hole in the sky, and plummets to earth. And she gives birth to this baby boy, and this baby boy ages quickly into a young hero, Fallen Star. And Fallen Star embarks on a number of adventures. And so they both retell this story. However, it's important to note that Riggs and Deloria both add small, subtle details to their translations. And these small, subtle details significantly alter the context and the meaning of the story. So for example, when you look at Riggs's translation, his translation is relatively short. It's four pages long, and it vilifies women, blaming them for the fall of man. And in many ways, Riggs translation, um, which is filtered through a Christian lens, recasts Fallen Star and his parents in the role of Adam and Eve. And so when you compare Riggs's translation to Deloria's translation, one of the things you quickly notice is that Deloria's translation is actually four times longer than Riggs's translation. Um, her translation reflects a more tribal worldview that emphasizes the importance of the Dakota kinship system and acknowledges that Dakota women are our traditional culture keepers and culture bearers. And so the settler colonial spin that Riggs gives to his narrative isn't surprising. Um, after all, he was an Episcopalian minister. And as he said from that quote earlier, he was determined to quote, put God's thoughts into their speech. And in many ways, he succeeded in that mission. Um, his biblical reinterpretation of Fallen Star has been published um, numerous times over the past 140 years in 1881, in 1883, in 1941, in 1977, in 2004, and 2015. Meanwhile, Deloria's translation of Fallen Star, which you can tell from this hand-drawn cover, has never been published in book form. And so in this chapter, I argue that privileging Riggs over Deloria as an authority on the Dakota literary tradition is troubling, not only because of the many cultural flaws that are inherent in Riggs's translation, but also because this is just another iteration of settler colonialism, settler colonialism that silences and oppresses Ocheti Shakoin women. So because Riggs and Boaz are often viewed as the experts on Dakota language literature instead of Dakota people themselves, Deloria often had difficulty getting published during her lifetime. Um, given, her given her difficulty publishing these translations, it was often challenging for her to reclaim and decolonize the Ocheti Shakoin literary tradition fully and on her own terms. However, as I've argued in the previous chapter, decolonization is a process, and Deloria was a resilient and a resourceful woman, and she wasn't able to publish and distribute her translation in print form during her lifetime, so instead, she frequently traveled across South Dakota to share her knowledge with both Native and non-Native people. And so in this chapter, I argue that Deloria paved the way for future Dakota and Nakota women to follow. This includes women like Dakota, uh, Dakota scholar Elizabeth Cooklin, who is the last chapter of my, of my book. And so the last body chapter of the book focuses on my dear friend and mentor, Elizabeth Cooklin who recently passed away. Um, Liz devoted much of her academic career to developing Native American studies as a legitimate academic discipline. Over the past four decades, she published more than a dozen NAS-related books, and a, as well as countless journal articles and book reviews. Liz was a mixed genre writer known for her sharp mind and tongue. She wrote boldly in defense of the Ocheti Shakoin and was unafraid to critique 
settler colonial violence and oppression, especially when it was directed at Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota women. In her 2000 speech, Decolonization of American Indians, Cooklin reiterates that settler misogyny, quote, challenges the power status of women and leads to the dogged dispossession of women's rights. So in this lengthy quote here, which I'm not gonna read for the sake of time, um, Cooklin attributes colonized non-tribal beliefs about male privilege and white supremacy to the Christian missionaries that I discussed back in chapter one. In both her fiction and her nonfiction, Liz sought to challenge these non-tribal ideologies by recentering women as our traditional culture keepers and culture bearers. In this chapter, I show that she often used her fiction to adapt the tribal land narratives that she heard in her youth. And an example of this would be her 1990 book, 1999 book, Aurelia, A Crow Creek Trilogy. And Aurelia attempts to reimagine a traditional Dakota Uhunkaka story about the corn wife in a more modern context as Aurelia Two Heart Blue, whom Cooklin describes as, quote, a unique modern Indian woman character, reservation based, who represents what happens to people in a colonized, suppressed cultural environment. And I'm not going to analyze that novel here. It's for 400 pages long. Um, but what I do argue in my chapter is that the content, the structure, the style of the novel are all grounded in the Dakota oral storytelling tradition. And according to Liz, everything, quote, must originate from the oral tradition, from the tribal land narratives that have guided our people for millennia and will continue to do so until the end of time. Liz believed that our oral traditions um, believe that when our oral traditions are, quote, defined in an appropriate way, have the potential to unify, unify and motivate the people from whom that knowledge originates. Um, she says the, everything originates from the oral tradition. So as a modern adaptation of the corn wife, Aurelia, a Crow Creek trilogy, is an empowering act of indigenous resistance especially when you consider the fact that nearly 200 years earlier, Riggs and his missionary colleagues insisted that our oral traditions would go extinct. Um, despite war, despite exile, boarding schools, and a number of harsh assimilationist policies intended to extinguish our language, our culture, our oral traditions, our tribal land narratives did not simply just fade away, which is what I'm trying to show in my book. Um, now, to ensure that our literary tradition would endure, Liz co-founded the Oak Lake Writers Society, a first of its kind uh, tribal group for Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota writers. And since its inception, Liz served as the society's mentor and she provided writing instruction and offered culturally relevant feedback on our work, including this manuscript, this book. Um, this year, the Oak Lake Writers Society, which is now known as the Ocheti Shakoin Writers Society, is celebrating our 30th anniversary. Um, Liz passed away in July, just a month before our 30th anniversary. And while her mentorship and her wisdom and guidance will be deeply missed, her legacy will go on. She gifted many, <coughs> many society members like myself with the tools we need to carry the Ocheti Shakoin literary tradition forward. And we only need to look at the writers who are at the book festival this week who are here presenting their books. Um, and I don't just mean my book, right? I also mean um, literary luminaries such as Joseph Marshall, who just presented before me, um, Diane Wilson, who is this year's one book, um, Nick Estes, who was last year's one book, um, right? And so our writers you know, are still alive and our oral tradition is still thriving in printed form. And so I don't think it's an overstatement for, you know, for me to say that all of us as Ocheti Shakuin writers were deeply inspired and influenced by Liz's work. And we owe her and all of the writers that I've mentioned here today, we owe them a debt of gratitude for protecting and defending the Ocheti Shakuin oral tradition for us and for many generations to come. So thank you. And I don't know if I went over time or if there's time for questions. Uh, no time for questions. If there's any questions. I 
Mm, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Renee. I'm a Black Bay Cherokee, and I've, I've loved being in Lakota area these last couple of decades. And very happy, you know, I would have passed out just to get here, so I'm oh. glad I did. But did you mention with Falling Star if there's any way to get an accurate translation today? Um, you can go online to the Dakota Indian Foundation website, and they've started scanning Ella Deloria's work, and so it's still not officially published in a book form, but um, there's PDF files on the Dakota Indian Foundation yeah, website. It's done, so it's yeah, it's already done, so yeah, if you go onto their website and look for the Ella Deloria archive, you can type in Fallen Star, and it will come up. It comes up page by page instead of a whole document, but yeah. No, no. Yeah. Other? Questions? We have time. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I just wanted to thank you for your presentation. I, I loved it. And I've had some involvement with the elk, uh, you know, elk mm -hmm. and uh, I've enjoyed every minute of that. I thought, number one, it's ironic that you're presenting this in an Episcopal church. I thought so too. I, when I saw that I was put here, I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And so they, they use these churches to, for the colonization. Yeah. Do you think, I know with a lot of the, um, you know, the boarding school deaths and stuff, that we, we hear a lot about that, but are efforts being made really to, in other ways, to try to address this decolonization? I mean, to try to support that. Yeah. Well, I honestly couldn't say with um, a specific denomination because I, um, I was raised Catholic, but I, I don't go to church anymore for a long time. And so I'm not really involved in any, any church. So I don't know what, you know, what they're trying to do to remedy it. Um, but I'm, I'm glad you brought that up about the tribes being divided because one of my favorite quotes is Vine Deloria Jr. And he says, it always bothered me the way that the government just divided us up like teams on a football game and each church got a different tribe. And so I think that's true. And I do hope that tribes are trying to, um, you know, address these wrongs, but I really, I don't know what they're currently doing today to do that. Oh, no, I didn't see the textbook, no. I was at the Minnesota Historical Society going through Riggs's papers. Yeah. Well, I have to confess that I was a sixth grade teacher, and when I look at how your book has taken apart and look at each of these people, um, the textbook itself, well, um, promotes, as you said, Yeah, I mean, one thing I appreciate is that Minnesota is sharing this history because um, I, I taught a lot of this when I was in, a teacher in South Dakota uh, four, four or five years ago now, and a lot of my students were unaware about this. Um, even though, right, the concentration camp was here in South Dakota, a lot of my students hadn't heard that history. So I do appreciate that Minnesota is at least trying to educate their students about this because that's the first step, right? We have to at least acknowledge that this history happened and then we can 
begin to think about how we heal and move forward from it. And so I do appreciate that Minnesota is doing that. And I hope South Dakota, you know, eventually follows lead and does that too, right? We need to acknowledge this happened. And then once we do, okay, how do we address it in a way that's meaningful and beneficial to our communities? But the first step is always acknowledging that past. Are there any other questions? All right, well, thank you guys for your time. I do appreciate it.